So today we will look at uh, AC circuits, an introduction to AC circuits. And uh, specifically, we just look at how we represent the AC and how we do our analysis in AC circuits. Okay. Right. So, an alternating uh, current is one whose magnitude and or direction changes with time, right? So the acronym AC means alternating current, and now we use it for any alternating electrical signal. So don't be surprised to hear someone talking about an AC voltage. AC now means any alternating electrical signal, right? So in AC signals, you realize that they alternate around some set points. So in our case, we will be looking at perfectly alternating uh, quantities. In other words, the a defined magnitude, a defined period, such that it's almost a repetitive sequence. So the first example is the sine wave. So in our sine wave, we start here. I think you did sine waves in mathematics, don't break. So, the standard sine wave starts at the point the zero, 00. That is our standard sine wave. It starts at the point zero, 00. Then it reaches its peak at 90 degrees, comes back to the original position at 180, reaches the negative peak or the reverse peak side at 270 degrees and comes back to the starting point at 360 to complete the cycle. Then it runs again just like that. And the area above the horizontal axis is equal to the area below the horizontal axis, and hence it's a symmetrical waveform. Then we go on to the triangle wave, right? So on the triangle wave, let's say it starts again at zero, zero. The slope between the upper going ramp and the lower going ramp is the same. So the slope is the same, so it's also symmetrical. So that the area at the top is also equal to the area at the bottom, but the gradients are the same. That differentiates this signal from that. So we jump on, let's say, let's jump to the sawtooth. On the sawtooth, one has a steeper gradient than the other. So the upgoing ramp is a steeper gradient than the downgoing ramp. That becomes a sawtooth waveform. Right. Again, the areas are equal. In other words, we are talking about symmetrical signals. Then we move on to the square wave. The square wave now, it comes from the fact that the upside is the same period as the, the downside, right? So it is a 50% duty cycle, so it to say that means the upside is 50% of the total cycle, and hence it's a square wave. Right. So the AC waveform is the most common one used in AC analysis. In other words, all our analysis in AC signals will be referring to sinusoidal waveforms, right? So the shape of the sinusoidal waveform is not affected by the presence of a resistor, a capacitor, or an inductor. 
it should be marked to the point that will say the shape. Okay, so other things might be changed, but the shape will not be changed by these three passive components that we talk about. Right? So what are the advantages of using AC over DC? Remember I say DC is unidirectional, same level. AC voltages can be efficiently stepped up or down using a transformer. In other words, when you want to transmit you know, electricity over long distances, you can step it up or step it down using transformers. You can do this with a DC uh, waveform. AC motors are also cheaper and simpler to construct than DC motors. So when you do with electric machines, you realize that the construction of a DC machine uh, is more difficult compared to the construction of an AC machine. Then also the switch gear for AC systems is similar than DC systems. We talk about the conductors, the circuit breakers and the like. Their design is similar in AC systems than in the DC uh, systems. Okay, so we want to look at the terms that are used in describing uh, AC signals. The first term is what we call the full cycle, right? So the cycle is where the direction and the magnitude of the waveform is the same. So if you move from point A, where the signal is at zero, and moving up, and you come to the next point where it does the same thing, signal at zero, moving up, at say point B, this completes a cycle, right? And so this will be repeated over and over again, right? It will be repeated over and over again. That's how the cycle is presented. Then, half the cycle now, single, right? Halfway through the cycle, that's half the cycle. Then the time taken to complete one cycle, the time taken to complete one cycle is the period T, right? Now I know it's revision, we have done these things at A level most likely. So it's just a revision, so to say, right? But the time taken to complete one cycle is the, the period. Okay. Then there are two points on our waveform. This is the positive peak and this is the negative peak, right? So we have uh, the first peak positive and the next peak negative peak. So that's where you get the peak value of your waveform, right? But the distance or the magnitude between the peak, negative peak and the positive peak is what we call the peak to peak value. The peak value is measured from zero and it is the same and is also the amplitude of our, our waveform, right? Then there's also what is called the effective value or the root mean square value RMS which is a DC value that is the same effect as the AC. We'll explain that in detail in the next slides. Right. So waveform that the path traced by our uh, function is a variable uh, compared against time or position, temperature, angular displacement, and so on and so on. But the instantaneous value becomes the magnitude of the signal at a certain time. Magnitude of the signal at a certain given time of the instantaneous value. So in AC, you realize that instantaneous values are represented by lowercase uh, letters, right? Then the amplitude that the maximum value that is attained by the uh, alternating signal, and that's also our peak value. 
for our max value. Peak to peak, like I said, displacement between the positive peak and the negative peak for crest, uh, crest to trough uh, displacement. Period T, the interval between consecutive repetitive uh, positions in a waveform, right? So if you pick any point in a waveform and the signal is the same magnitude and direction at that point, then that will be your period, okay? You can also define period as time taken by a signal to complete one cycle measured in seconds. Then the cycle becomes that portion which is contained in one period of time. Okay. Frequency now, we talk about frequency, we are now talking about the number of cycles completed in one second. Hence, F is about one of a T because it pro completes F cycles over one period. Right. Then angular frequency, that will be the number of radians covered in one second. In other words, we are just talking about the number, the, the, the magnitude of angles covered in one second. So it's again a frequency, but we're talking about angle. But then we know that in one period, we go through 100, uh, 100 and, uh, 360 degrees. So our period is to uh, our displacement is two pi and the time is t. That's why omega is called two pi over t. But then one over t is called the frequency f in the end omega is called two pi f. Okay, omega becomes equal to two pi f. This is a very important formula for you to remember. Omega is called 2 pi f. I know you have used this uh, formula somewhere else. So this is what we call a waveform, the trace. Then the equation of a signal becomes the mathematical expression that represents the AC signal. So by standard, if our sine wave starts at zero, we just write say V is called the Vm sine omega t. All right, uh, this is not new to you. You know it, right? It means the side wave is not shifted. It is starting at zero, zero, right? But if the sine wave is shifted to the left, let's say by an angle phi, then it becomes Vt is equal to Vm sine omega t plus phi. That's a shift to the left, and it becomes omega t minus phi if it is a shift to the to the right. So shift to the left, it's omega t plus phi. That is phi will be the shift in the angle. Shift to the right, omega t minus phi. That is also very important because we will use it when you look at phase difference in AC seconds. Then we talk about a phasor. A phasor is just like a vector line that represents a complex electrical quantity, right? So if you draw an arrow like this and you tell us the angle of that arrow and also its uh, magnitude r, then you are also representing a a sinusoidal waveform as a as a vector. That is what we call a phase, right? So in this case, if our say our signal is shifted by an angle phi, then the phase will be r at an angle of of phi. So how we measure our angles, we measure them from the east, okay? Going anticlockwise direction, that's how we measure our angles. 
in the phasors. So we're going to zero. But if also look, the phasor also coincides with the position of the waveform in the the position of the signal in the waveform. The layer that also 270 will correspond to that. So I'm just representing that as a, as a line. But we can represent these phasors in what is called the rectangular coordinates or polar coordinates. So in the rectangular coordinates, we are talking about what's the x value, what's the y value, right? But the y value is in the complex called uh, coordinate side. Therefore, it says a j, which represents our complex coordinate. I know in mathematics you use i, but here we avoid i because we use it for current and other things. That becomes the polar coordinates x plus uh, j y. So x, I'm saying we are going here up to x. Then we go up y, right? That's plus j y. Yes, it can be negative or positive. Then there is polar. The polar now we are representing it as a, as a phasor, giving the magnitude or amplitude r in the radius, sorry, and the angle theta. So the polar coordinate P is called r, r theta. In other words, the polar coordinate just gives you the magnitude, the amplitude, and the angle from the from the east, okay, from our vertical x, from our horizontal axis. But you can convert between the polar coordinate and the rectangular coordinate by knowing uh, this. So in other words, we are saying, if you know the polar, uh, the polar, the rectangular coordinates, then you know that the amplitude R becomes equal to square root of x squared plus y squared, that's by the Pythagoras theorem. And theta is called uh, actan of y over x, that's uh, trigonometrical ratios, remember? That's y over x, and if this is our angle of theta, then that will be tan, okay? So you can convert from rectangular to polar using, uh, using that, okay? So the standard sine wave is a positive zero cross over point at t is equal to zero or at theta is equal to zero. So we always try to make sure that the angle theta should correspond to the time t. So if theta is called zero, we should be corresponding to the time t is called zero. And any other signal that you can get will be a shifted version of that standard sine wave. Anything that you get after that becomes a shifted version of that. So we have AM sine omega t, then you can shift to plus or minus, where a shift to the left will give you a positive, and a shift to the right will give you a, a negative. Okay? So resultantly, if we have Y is got sine x, this is our standard crossover at zero, zero. Then this one, which is shifted to the left by one unit, becomes y is called sine x plus one. In other words, our amplitude is assumed to be one there. Then this one shifted to the right by one unit becomes called y is called sine x minus one. Okay, so we have situations where we have shifted by exactly pi over two, which is 90 degrees. So this becomes plus uh, pi over two. This becomes minus pi over two. So you should understand those shifts in our waveforms. Okay, you should understand those shifts in our waveforms. 
right. So, when we talk about waveforms, we can only compare them if they have the same frequency. Okay? So, in other words, if we talk about a shifted sine waveform, their frequency should be the same first before we can talk about which one is leading or which one is is lagging okay so the terms leading and lagging are used when we are describing signals of the same frequency so what does that mean if we say a signal is leading it will reach the positive zero crossover point earlier than the other right in other words it is a more positive phase angle than the other in other words, this one is plus zero, this one is minus 30, so voltage will be leading current in that situation, right? So a leading signal is a pos more positive phase angle than the other. In other words, when you are measuring from here to there, a leading uh, waveform is a more positive phase angle. Then the difference between the phase angles is what you call the phase difference. Okay? So as an example, we have a signal V is called Vm sine omega t, it is here. In another signal I is called Im sine omega t minus 30. That means it is shifted to the right by 30 degrees. That means it has been delayed by, by 30 degrees. As a result, voltage leads current by 30 degrees and yes the first difference is, is 30 degrees okay if we were to represent that on a phasor diagram as a phasor you find out that your voltage will be along the zero axis and then your current will be at minus 30 degrees why minus because when we are really I mean, Measuring our angle we measure in the anticlockwise direction. So the minus 30 will be corresponding to the 330 degree point. Okay? So that's the minus 30. Our reference axis is it. Uh, T is equal to zero. Then we also have what is called the average value symbol the arithmetic average of all alternating quantities over one cycle. If we talk about that, then it means for a symmetrical waveform over one cycle, the average is equal to zero. So in order to make those calculations, we usually find the average over, say, a free period. So average value will be area under one cycle over the base. But remember, we said, in our signals, this area will be equal to that. So as a result, you realize that the average value is, is zero. So you really talk about the average value in our AC quantities. We talk about the RMS value, which is, what, which is the root mean square. So the RMS is equivalent to the DC value that gives the same average power as the AC signal, right? So what are we saying? So we have an AC signal, right? Let's say V AC, right? Let's say it produces power P. Then a DC signal, V DC, which produces the same power as the AC signal, becomes its RMS value. So we to say, V A C RMS becomes equal to V D C. Okay. So if you could determine that DC voltage, which has the same heating effect or same power effect as the AC signal, that becomes your RMS value. 
right? Let's look at it in this way. The instantaneous power is being given by I squared R. We know that from our DC analysis. But then in AC, this I is not a symbol or expression. It is given by something like I m sine omega t plus theta. So if you square that, power becomes called I m squared R sine squared omega t plus theta. Right? I m squared sine squared omega t is now our R and those are our R. It's now our I and that is our R. So how do you determine the average power? You find the area under the waveform, right? Then you divide by the, by the period. So the P average is called m squared over R or over two, right? For a DC source driving the same resistance, P is called I DC squared R. So I DC is called I m over over root two means I R M S is called I m over root two. So you might not need to follow everything, but remember that the R M S value is equal to the amplitude of your signal over root two, or the peak value of the signal over root two. That gives you the root mean square value of your of your uh, AC signal. That gives you the root mean square value of your the AC signal, right? Vm over over root two. Then, after that, we now go on to power in AC circuits. So I find out that in a DC circuit is very simple. Power is about voltage times current in watts. There's nothing to worry about in that case. Power is about to voltage times current in watts. But in the AC, instantaneous power will be instantaneous voltage multiplied by instantaneous current. So if VT, that is the instantaneous voltage, is called Vm sine omega T, say plus alpha, where alpha now will be the phase angle of the voltage. And IT is called Im sine omega T plus beta, where beta now becomes the phase angle of the current. Then it can be shown that the average power will be equal to 1 over 2 Vm Im cos alpha minus beta. This becomes the phase difference between the voltage and the current. Then the average power becomes about 1 over 2 Vm Im cos theta, where theta, the phase angle between the two. So cos theta will be equal to that alpha minus, minus beta. Then power is called Vi cos theta, that voltage times current, where V and I are now the RMS values. So what I mean, what I mean is, is if you take this one, right, it's Vm, okay, I am using a mouse, so I might not write well. Vm over root 2 times Vm times Im, sorry, Im over root 2. This will reduce to Vm Im over 2, right? But if you break it, you realize that this is an RMS value, this is an RMS value. So in other words, if you are given the RMS value, which is usually the case if you find the appliances and the like, then the power will be Vi cos theta, where cos theta is the phase angle between the current and the voltage. And that cos theta is also our power factor. It is called the power factor, right? So cos theta is the power factor. So power factor is about the cosine of the angle between the voltage and the on the current. And when we're talking about the power factor, we'll talk about the words leading or lagging. So a power factor is leading if current leads voltage. What does that mean? It means the current should yield a more positive angle than the voltage. That's a leading power factor. It is lagging if the current lags the voltage. That means the current is a less positive value than the, than the voltage, 
And then we talk about leading ends and legging. Right. So, having talked about those in summary, we now want to see how do we apply them so that we know how to calculate quantities for uh, our components in the circuit. So, what I was talking about is just theoretical, where we're not looking at any component, but it's general, it's generic, that the general uh, concept about our currents and voltages in AC. Now we want to see when that current flows through a resistor, a capacitor or an inductor or a combination of them, what is the response of the circuit uh, to that? So the first thing that we have to know is that impedance is the opposition to flow of AC, right? In other words, you would say impedance is, in loose terms, the resistance of an AC circuit. Though it becomes inaccurate because the resistance is also involved in calculating impedance. In other words, the total opposition that a circuit offers to the flow of AC becomes its impedance. Right. So let's look at our first component that we've been looking at, the resistor. Right. So for a resistor, if our voltage V is got Vm sine omega t, then the current can be given as I is got Vm sine omega t over R, that is ohm's law. This is to our V, right? So V over R, right? And so Vm, that maximum voltage over the resistance gives you the maximum current. So we can also say I is got Im sine omega t, right? Is what I was explaining. So voltage and current through a resistor are in phase, so the phase difference is zero. In other words, if you see that the voltage and the current through a resistor are in phase, the voltage and the current through the resistor are in phase, or their phase angles are equal, it means that component is a resistor. Okay? So the impedance of a resistor is equal to its resistance straight away. So this is the only situation whereby if you are given R is about two ohms, then it means its impedance Z of R is also equal to two ohms straight away. Right? And if you write it in ohms law, it means R is called voltage at angle zero of a current at angle zero. They might not be at angle zero, but because they will be at the same angle, it will still be V over, over I. Remembering that V and I will be RIMS values. Remembering that V and I will be RIMS values. Then we look at an inductor. Now, the inductor now gives us a slightly different situation. Okay. It also offers opposition to the flow of, of AC. And its opposition is called inductive reactance, XL. Right? So if our current through the inductor is again I m sine omega t, then the voltage across the inductor is given by VL is called L di by dt. Remember, we talked about this in inductor circuits. The voltage across. Can you, can you mute your mic, please? Can you mute your mic? Thank you. So I'm saying the voltage across the inductor is the inductance multiplied by the rate of change of current through that, that inductor. Can you mute your, please, please. Okay. And this 
can be shown that VL will be equal to omega L, I M cos omega, omega T, right? Then that becomes about omega L, I M sine omega T plus 90 degrees. And then this becomes equal to V M sine omega T plus 90 degrees. We don't have to, to show this, but if we integrate that, we should be able to come to, to this. Because I am is called, I am is called to I am sine omega t. So that omega comes out, multiplies with L, then I am, then you get cos omega t. I'm sure we know about that uh, differentiation. So that the expression of the voltage now will be Vm sine omega t plus 90 degrees. Now, if you look at the two, it means the phase angle of the current is zero. The phase angle of the voltage is plus 90. So it means the voltage is leading the current by, by 90 degrees. The voltage is leading the current by, by 90 degrees. So the inductive reactance now should be the voltage across the inductor over the current through the inductor. And look at it that way. It becomes omega L sine omega T plus 90 over sine omega T, right? And it can be reduced to omega L at an angle of 90 degrees. Right? Omega L at an angle of, of 90 degrees because VL is the one which is at the top and leading. So, inductive reactance of an inductor XL is equal to omega L. Right? And the angle of that uh, reactance will be always 90 degrees. If you are given F, that means omega is about 2 pi F, so it will be 2 pi F L. You are given F. It becomes 2 pi F L. But this is very important. This will be your, the mark value of X L is omega L. <coughs> and then its angle is always, always 90 degrees. Right? So, We had gone as far as here. Now, reactance is in the imaginary side or the complex side. Hence, it will be also written as JXL because it is on the positive imaginary axis. So it is JXXL. In other words, you can write XL is about omega L at 90 degrees, or is about J omega L, or is about to J 2 pi F L. So what does that mean? It means inductive reactance depends on inductance and, and frequency. If you look at it, if the frequency is very low, let's say approaching zero, then the inductive reactance of the inductor or the reactance of the inductor is close to zero. So you could approximate it to a short circuit. That's why in transient analysis, when there's no change in the direction, the, vo the voltage across the inductor will be zero and the current will be maximum. It shows a short circuit behavior. But if the frequency is very, very high, then XL becomes very, very large. And the end, it offers maximum opposition to the flow of AC. And the end, at very, very high frequencies, an inductor can be taken as a short circuit. 
because it will have maximum opposition to the flow of current. That's why when we're switching the switch on instantaneously and we are first trying to force the voltage to rise from zero to Vm, the current starts at zero. Why? Because it will be acting as a is an open circuit. So we can say an inductor will pass DC and block AC. The inductor will pass DC and block AC. Then the third and last component that we are going to look at in our AC circuit analysis will be the capacitor. Its opposition to the flow of AC is capacitive reactance, XC. And if this value is given as Vm sine omega t, right, you can show that uh, this current will be Im sine omega t plus 90. Right? Taking these values, it can also then be shown that capacitive reactance Xc will be equal to 1 over omega c at an angle of minus 90 degrees. At an angle of minus 90 degrees, because it will be zero here, minus 90, so the angle will be minus 90. And then that can also be written as minus j, one over omega c, or minus j, one over two pi fc. This is also another important formula to remember because we use it uh, very frequently in our calculations. Now, again, its reactance depends on capacitance and, and frequency. So realize that at very low frequencies close to DC, a capacitor emulates an open circuit. Why? Because as C approaches zero, HC approaches infinity. Then at very high frequencies, the capacitor will be approximated to a short circuit because as the F approaches infinity, XC will be approaching zero. In other words, a capacitor will pass AC and block DC. Okay? So that's all about the components that we use in our AC circuit analysis. So it is very important for us to check and understand how we calculate the reactance of a capacitor and the reactance of an inductor. So an inductor is omega L. The capacitor is one over omega C. Meaning to say you will be given the frequency or the angular frequency for you to be able to calculate that. And then after that, you can calculate any other quantities in your circuit analysis as you will see in the next lecture. So for now, uh, we end here. Uh, we we'll stop the recording. And uh, then if someone, anyone has questions, you can hear your questions. <laughs>